you know, it's just like <laughs> basketball's man, it, it's it's deep, bro. It's deep, but people it's simple as well. But people try to people try to do a lot of stupid things to complicate it, man. And this is one of those things I feel like. Yeah. It's a great point. The whole momentum thing, like there's no advanced analytic that you can look at to be like, yo, this guy and like you could do the whole plus minus shit, which yeah. it's funny. They they love talking about that. And and when I talk about they, I talk about all the numbers people. Yeah. Until it goes against what they believe in. I just don't think he has it anymore. Should any team want Carmelo Anthony? Yes, sir, Carmelo. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Control the Narrative, a podcast where we control the narrative that the media creates. If you're new around here, subscribe to catch our weekly podcast on YouTube. Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And if you're a Turner, a subscriber, or a Control the Narrative member, we appreciate you a little more if you're, if you're a member of us. Um, every week we have people on here who are mellow fans and who control the narrative in their own right. And this week, again, every week we have a special guest. Do not get me wrong. But this week we have a special guest, um, someone who has a lot of similarities, someone who has inspired me and control in a lot of different ways with what he's been able to do with his own platform. So um, without further ado, I would love to welcome him to control the narrative, Ekum Negra, my guy. How you feeling, bro? How you doing? Good, man. I appreciate you more than you know for taking time out. And, you know, we were just speaking real quick before about how, you know, you inspire and like a lot of the people who post about basketball, whether they only post highlights or certain things, but there's uh, very few people who, know the game by just watching it it's a crazy crazy theory to like watch the game and be able to decipher it without looking at a box score but right. you're one of those few people who's able to do that so appreciate uh, you, i appreciate y'all having me on man I, I really i really like what you guys do man you guys another group that just you. really sees the game and can dissect it with your eyes and not no need no box score <laughs> to tell you what's going on man yeah advanced that's that rare. Yeah. that's rare now <laughs> yes sir man how many points Melo averages on Tuesday nights in February when it's under 60 degrees? You know, we don't really talk about shit like that, but uh, let's get Sorry. into it, man. So, so you know, like we just talked about, analytics over the past 10-plus years, and really it's gone further than that, but over the last 10 years, it's really become a deciding factor in the moves GMs make, the way the game is played. So what are your overall thoughts on what analytics has just done to the game of basketball? Man, I'm not I'm not a fan of it, man. I'm very vocal. Like uh I think it's kind of sucked the purity out of the game. I think it's took away the art. I think it's took away some of the toughness. Um, you know, and, and some of the, you know, the things that the game of basketball was built on, you know, the game that a lot of us fell in love with, right? Um, it did that by again, I I like they thought they were smart by bringing in all these, you know, four-year college degree or whatever finance guys or yeah, uh, numbers guys, you know, math, math dudes, you know, in and kind of, you know, be sophisticated. But really what ended up happening, if you really watch, they've kind of dumbed the game down. Right. And, you know, I think the game, though it is talented and more skilled, probably from a one to 12 standpoint than ever, I think the way it's played and the degree of difficulty and you know, just the overall competitiveness and toughness on a possession to possession basis, I think has taken a major, major hit. And I and I think only people that really understand the game can really see that. Um, you know, because you know, and that comes that comes to analytics, man. Analytics has changed the entire sport. We're almost watching a different sport than what it was ten years 100%. ago. Even even six, seven years ago, right? Like the game changed so much. But man, it is it is what it is, man. I mean, analytics to me, it's like a little tool, right? Like, hey, what am I shooting from this spot? What am I shooting from that spot? Yep. Okay, I could go work on that, or you know, obviously that's how players should think. But you know, it, the way that it's, I just I just hate what it's done to the game in terms of, you know, you you got this whole style and this whole perception on guys, and people are just basing it off a plus minus equation. And really, you know, that's not. That's not that's not basketball, right? That's that's not how basketball works. You know, basketball's art. Basketball's a momentum based, you know, rhythm based sport. You know, it's sporadic in nature. Basketball is it can't be quantified, um, you know, with those types of numbers. Um, maybe yeah. over the course of a year, you could bring in certain things and certain numbers and stats, obviously, to 
tell a story, but like, there's no way you can just, you know, blatantly just look at a piece of paper and say, this is what it is. There's no fucking way, bro. Bro. I, I think one of the things you said at the end, which is like, one of the main points is I don't think you are. I'm definitely not sitting here saying, yo, don't look at analytics at all. Don't listen to anything. It says it's used right. more as like validation right. or a little bit of a storytelling where, you know, again, you mentioned the four year accounting majors in college or finance or, or numbers majors in college and they come out and then they start making moves when they've played pickup basketball like 30 times in their life. It's like, how do you respect and like look at the product it produces again not saying that you know it's subjective but like today's product that they may puts out is way different than what it put out 10 years ago versus what it put out in 20 years ago so right the whole analytics thing like you know you and i it seems like we're similar ages grew up in the era of one-on-one who's the better man can you right. stop this guy right. uh can you score on this guy and shit like that kobe mellow um you know tim duncan ai like all guys like that where it didn't matter if they were two for 10 in, in, in the half. If yeah. you had the ball in the, if they had the ball in their hands in the last possession, you're living or dying with them. And, you know, that's still true to a certain extent. But that was the whole game. Like yeah. now we see that at the end of the fourth quarter and, you know, in the playoffs and shit. But that's what it was like all the time. And I missed the shit out of that. Man, I missed it too, bro. Like that era of basketball, man. Like, you know, even the 90s had it. But like, Really yeah. going in, into the 2000s and going up until I want to say like 20. I think this revolution start like really took off and really came league wide like 2014, 15 ish. After that, you saw this whole shift happen, right? Um, before that, it was still, you know, a half and half. But like you said, like these accounting guys, like these numbers guys came in, no feel whatsoever for the game, no awareness in terms of, you know, hey, he he might be you know, uh, coming off a screen tonight, a little bit sore from the night before, a little bit, you know, uh, maybe that's not a spot that he's comfortable yeah. at. Maybe maybe that's like the worst spot on the floor to put him at to start a game and it gets him cold. You know, it's just like <laughs> basketballs, man, it, it's, it's deep, bro. It's deep, but people – it's simple as well, but people try to people try to do a lot of stupid things to complicate it, man, and this is one of those things I feel like. Yeah. It's a great point. The whole momentum thing, like there's no advanced analytic that you can look at to be like, yo, this guy. And like you could do the whole plus minus shit, which yeah. it's funny. They they love talking about that. And and when I talk about they, I talk about all the numbers people yeah. until it goes against what they believe in. Like when we talk about, yo, Melo had the plus minus six straight, yeah. best plus minus on team, six games. Right. Over, they're like, oh, yeah, but LeBron, when LeBron was out, I'm like, bro, if you if you don't want to hear that now, then like. I don't want to hear it when it's right. what's in your Another thing, stuff. bro, with the analytics thing it's is, funny. like, it's a little bit deeper on the fact that, like, it gave a lot of dudes that were never involved or never had that type of, uh, you know, love for the game. It gave them an involvement. It gave them a way to be involved, to, to try to turn the game into a marketplace, right? A lot of it comes from, like, yo, a lot of these dudes just, like, there was jocks, there was guys that loved the game, there was guys that loved basketball, and there was, like, you know, I hate to put it this way, but, like, regular, you know, geeks, right? And it's, like... <laughs> It's yeah. like they come from a place of almost like frustration, right? It, it, it's like they're trying to um, be gatekeepers in a way and, and try to, you know, I even think the way that some of these guys got involved in front offices, like, yo, it was like a hierarchy, like, you know, otherwise the way basketball has evolved, like there should be players that have played the game filling front offices right now, filling it across the boards. Um, you know, you look at what a guy like James Jones was able to do Phoenix, yeah, times, was right, right away. And, and it's like there's a lot of guys that I know, guys that have played in the league that are very, very, you know, um, articulate, that are very, very, you know, I want to say qualified to go into a front office and run a team and have a major influence. But, you know, they got these geeks that have never touched a ball in their life in front of them. But, like, you wonder what that is, right? A lot of that's like, yo, it's, it's really deep, man. Like, we can't have all these, you know, young urban – you know, um, guys come in and, you know, take over and, and really run shit. I mean, I think some of that has to do with that, man. So that was like a kind of like an excuse to keep be able to keep guys like that out, you know, be, be able to keep guys like you, you yourself and I, you know, away from from those types of, um, you know, powerful positions. So I think this shit goes a little bit deeper, you know. Great point. Great point. One thing I really quick wanted to touch on is uh, when we started talking about this analytics and all that little follow-up question. We have this convo a lot where obviously Curry individually changed the game in terms of three-pointers yeah. more than any person in recent history for sure. Yeah. Do you think the 2012-2013 Knicks were the first team to like really embrace that 
three or die, live and die by the three? A little bit. I think so because you had <laughs> – that was really a team of hoopers too. Like they were just going out there and, you know, it, it was kind of an extension of the 08 Nuggets if you really look yeah. back. A lot you of know, similar faces. Yeah. Are, was Steve Novak on that team? Kmart. Yeah, all Kmart, them. Steve Novak. I'm talking about the Knicks team, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Steve Novak. You know, you had J.R. Smith. Who else they had, man? They were – Camby. Camby. Kurt Thomas, Sheed. Yeah, Kurt Thomas. Kid. They were shooting the lights out, man. Like, I remember, you know, watching that team. They had – I've never seen Madison Square Garden in my lifetime, you know, as lit, it was, as lit as it was. Maybe I've seen Knicks tapes from the – 90s but the way the brand of basketball they were playing was very you know modern um the way you see now but they were actually the greater part about that is it's like they had this perfect mix they had this perfect blend because they weren't committed to that mathematically you know that wasn't there they were just kind of instinctively doing that and you know you had nights where Melo would hit eight threes you had nights where jr would hit eight threes you had nights where steve novak would get hot you know who else? They, who else? They have 2012, 13 man. Um, Felton, Felton, Felton would go off. Uh, you know, you you had guys that were just really out there, just playing basketball, having fun, playing through, playing playing as a team. Um, you know, Woodson had them clicking, and and um, you know, it was just a fun brand of basketball. But yeah, you know, it's crazy. The night that Steph Curry had um, 54 at the Garden. Yep. It was weird. It was like a. It, it's something weird about that night, man. It's like you know, you you saw that era kind of end or like it was some type of symbolism yeah. that took place that night man. yeah you know and nobody wants whenever people talk about that nobody wants to talk about the fact that the knicks won that game and that yeah. ray felton blocked his yeah. three to yeah. pretty much seal the game so yeah you would just wanted to th- won that. <laughs> yeah everybody thought, yo when curry dropped 54 at the guard i'm like yo do you remember they lost that game or you just want to <laughs> leave that part out yeah. um yo real quick sorry to interrupt if you're watching on youtube or listening on apple Podcasts or spotify but just wanted to let you know that we have merch at Control the Narrative, and it's uh, pretty fire, in my opinion. This is the Pixel Mellow t-shirt that I'm rocking. Anything from Cuse Mellow to New York Mellow, Hoodie Mellow on this shirt. We got Scapegoat merch. We got Black Ball merch. We got just regular Control merch. Um, shop CTRLTheNarrative.com. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, beanies, stickers. Shop CTRLTheNarrative.com. I think I got my point across. Go check it out. I bet you you'll find something you like. Appreciate the support as well. Obviously, you know, the merch sales help us fund these podcast episodes that we get to record every single week. So appreciate you um, and back to the show. Yo, so we, we talked about analytics a little. I'm also curious to get your thoughts on ring culture because it's something that I personally think since LeBron went to Miami has also changed. And it was like, again, around the same time it changed yeah. the NBA. How much of an impact do you think ring culture has made on the NBA in both the eyes of fans and players? Huge. Uh, you know, again, <clears throat> I'm wearing this hoodie, right? Casuals. They love ring culture, right? Because, again, it's a it's a way to get people that weren't really involved. Basketball is much, much deeper than a championship, bro. Basketball is much cheaper, much deeper than – you know, a successful title run, especially when you look at the NBA level, man, 82 games, year after year, playoffs. It's a journey, right? And these are some of the the highest talents levels that we're ever going to witness in our life in pro sport, you know. So yep. in a team sport, one man can only do so much. In a team sport, in a team setting, you need one to 15 to click. You need coaching staff to click. You need front office, everyone on one cil- firing on one cylinder, which is very rare to capture, which is why we barely see three peats, which is why we barely see even repeats, because it is the hardest thing to do. Because it's it's you know, you see all this talk about these rings and these championships, you know, like that doesn't tell me much, man. Like I gotta know who in a team sport setting, like who was playing with who, who was coaching with who, who was doing this and that, what were the circumstances, yep. who did they face? Who did they face this year? Who did they face that year? What was the timing like? What was the matchups like, right? There's a million and one factors. And truth be told, they're all out of a player's control, an individual's control. Um, Whatever these individuals do, they max it out. They do what they can do on their own for the most part, right? Um, You know, there's been instances where guys come up short. There's been instances where guys choke. There's been, you know, that happens. That's a part of the game too. But, you know, ring culture has really poisoned and dumbed the game down as well to me because, 
you got all these people sitting here fucking summarizing a guy's career based on a ring or no ring. You know, they got these ranking obsessions, you know, ranking and the media is to blame for this too, you know, valuing a certain guy more, you know, holding him a little bit higher standard than a certain guy because one guy wasn't able to win a chip. You know, I look at players like Tracy McGrady. I look at players like Allen Iverson. I look at players like Vince Carter. If they came in after 20, 2010 in this player movement era, can you imagine how many rings they would have won? If they got to go pick, you know, and choose, who do I get to play with? Kobe yeah. Bryant would have had fucking nine championships, 12, 10 championships. If he had the luxury of, I'm going to go get T-Mac, um, you know, and I'm going to pair him with Shaq and, hey, we're going to go. Or, hey, uh, I got Pal. Pal's here. Let's, let me go get like a Brandon Roy. Let me go get like a – uh, yeah. Paul, even then, right? And but they never, that they weren't like that, right? The game wasn't like that that time. You know, I really, the decision I feel like kind of broke the game because that pressure was on LeBron to win championships, and you know he kind of like after years of coming up short on his own, but you know maxing it out. LeBron did what he could do individually, of course. And, and when he hit that wall, it was kind of like the media put this. Social media was blowing up. Everywhere you go, it's like you got to win, you got to win, you got to win a rank, and, and that kind of forced him to do take matters into his own hands and really do it and say, okay, now go. Now talk about me because now you can't beat me, Boston. Now you can't beat me so-and-so because I got my own guys with me now too, you know. So I don't value – like, I listen, bro, if you win a ring, it's huge. It's it's an incredible accomplishment. It takes a lot of things lining up though, um, you know. And, look, I, I think the two best players that I've ever seen in my life are Jordan and Kobe. So the, the, those two combined for 11 chips to me, right, like – Look, I value championships, but they're not the end-all, be-all, man. Yeah. Yeah, man, I, I say it all the time, and a lot of people over here obviously feel the same way because we've watched Carmelo for right. 19 years and never been in the finals, let alone won a championship. But I think to me and to a lot of people, it's like – and people don't really realize this, but championships are all about situations. Like you summed it up perfectly when you're like, yo, 1 through 15, fuck 1 through 5, fuck only the people who play 1 through 15 – have to be on the same page. The coach has to be on the same page. The coach has to be on the same page with the front office too. They have to be on, on the same page with the ushers and the stands, like everything. everything, everything has to be on the same page. Everything. And of like Carmelo Anthony, right? Yeah. Robert, Robert Ori has seven championships. Is he a better player than Michael Jordan? No. Like if, if people just want to talk about that, like Adam Morrison has a championship. <laughs> Jared Dudley has a championship. Are they better players? And no, they were in better positions than Melo. And like, not to turn this into a mellow thing. Right. A lot of people listening probably don't want to do it, but, um, <laughs> you know, like he just put himself in bad situations throughout his career. And like, you know, think about if he didn't take that extension with the Nuggets and he went to Miami mm-hmm. instead of Bosch, you know, think about if Mello, he went to Chicago yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and shit like that. You know, like, the thing, Melo, bro, like he was cut from that other cloth, you know, and I still think he is to this day. He kind of had to cave into the culture now because he was starting to get penalized for not giving in. Yeah. You know, like in the 2000s, in the 90s, bro, like it was looked down on to team up. Bottom line, period. You know, like you weren't going to leave your city. You weren't going to leave the team that took you and say, yo, I'm going to go link up with this star over there. That started in 2010, to be honest with you. Till 2014, 15, it was still pretty much looked down on. Um, You know, you you remember the criticism. Then the criticism shifted to Kevin Durant because when he went to the Warriors, right? So, like, people forget, man, that decision had a lot of – it had a lot of like, you know, it left a little bit of a bad taste in a lot of OG fans, fans mouths because, you know, you had never seen that. It was kind of like they broke the system. Kind of, it was like a cheat code. Yeah. Um, Melo coming from, you know, from his roots as a hooper, like, yo, that was a guy that was individually able to give you 50, give this, give you 60, you know, like who, yeah. in, at what point did Melo wake up saying, yo, from in the Nuggets days saying, hey, I'm going to need other superstars to come join me and help me win. He thought that he probably thought like, yo, I could do this shit myself, you know, and, and he probably would have, right. Had at some point, maybe even those Knicks years had the league not shifted towards that super team thing, you know, because then imagine, cause you got to remember, bro, like in the two thousands, in the night, even in the late nineties, like you had one star team with like a premier all-star and then role players, you know, yeah. Iverson, Iverson is my favorite player of all time, but you know, and I think they got rid of him too quick in Denver anyways. But, like, he went in there and they, they won 50 games. They won 54 games once, you know. Um, and, uh, sorry, no, they won 50 games in t- 2007, 2008. And it's like, yo, in that time, in that Western Conference, you know, that Nuggets team, what would the narrative have been if 
they take care of business and don't end up as the eighth seed who's going to face the Lakers, the champs, or the sorry, the Western Conference champs. What would the narrative have been if they were a third, fourth, fifth seed? Now all of a sudden they win round one. Okay, yep. now round two they get a better matchup. Oh shit, they're going to see the Lakers in the West Finals instead. You know what I mean? Yep. And now it's like, okay, we're not going to trade AI. We're going to keep this going for a couple more years, right? Melo's going to become the vet, uh, the, the leader completely, and we're going to take it home through him. It's just, bro, like situations are uh, everything when it comes to winning and when it comes to having success in the league. Um, and I think Melo had a few good ones, but they were never the – at no point could we look on a piece of paper, look at Melo's roster before the season started and say, yo, he has the best roster. They're the they're favorite, guaranteed, yeah. They're guaranteed to go – to the finals. We could say that with LeBron. We could say that with Kobe. We could say that with KD. We could say that with all the other elite talents. Steph Curry. We could say that even with, um, you know, many guys at his position, even, even like Paul George and Kawhi, you know, two guys that play that position. Like, we've been able to look at them on a piece of paper before this season starts and say, yo, they could go all the way. But for Melo, we've never confidently for the last 19 years been able to say that. Maybe other than this year before this year started. Yeah. And then last thing on this is those mellow AI teams, people forget this, that they got knocked out first round both of the years they were in the playoffs. Both the years they got knocked out by the eventual Western Conference champions. Yeah, and sure. what's funny is, I say this all the time, people are like, oh, it doesn't mean shit, where in 2007, I believe, yeah. they lost to the Spurs. They lost to the Spurs in five. Yeah. The Cavs, who were Eastern Conference champions, lost to the Spurs in four. Yeah. And the, yep, and the Spurs... I mean, the Nuggets won game one, man. They came out the yeah. gate, Melo and AI combined for like 70 points. I feel like, yeah. and, you know, they put on a show. It looked like for a moment, yo, these guys might take care of business. But yeah. like, they were a six seed. A lot of that with those Nuggets teams, bro. And I really think those Nuggets teams had the best chance probably to win it. Um, and the Knicks teams that you guys had in 12-13 as well had that chance. Um, you know, but I feel like with those Nuggets teams, right, like had they taken care of a few more, all it took was a few more regular season wins. Yeah. You get a better seed. You don't face the West Conference champs in the first round. Now you get to build some momentum going into those matchups. Yeah. You know, a lot of that was bad habits from the team. A lot of that was George Carl was not a defensive coach whatsoever. Um, you know, there were certain habits that they didn't have, and they didn't take care of business on certain regular season nights. Lost games that they should have won, and that really fucked them. Those teams could have won 60 games. Facts. All facts, bro. It's just crazy. Um, talk about that all the time, like 12, 13, we talk about too, but yeah. kind of switching it up a little bit, um, focusing on Melo, you know, we, I try not to talk about Melo, but it's just so hard and people would be saying shit to me if I wasn't talking about him on here. So one thing, you know, I've been following your page for a little while on control and also on my personal Instagram account and shit like that. Um, all right, last interruption, because if you're watching or listening to the podcast for this long, you probably fuck with us. And if you fuck with us, you'll probably fuck with all the perks that you get from being a Control the Narrative member, whether that's access to our invite-only Discord where we're talking basketball all the time or opportunities to join the next episode of Control. So whenever we need a guest, I go in our Discord. I say, yo, who's free? Who wants to hop on the next episode? And I pick from there. You get 20% off merch forever. And then you also get member-exclusive merch all by being a member. Tiers start at $2 a month. So if you fuck with us, Go check out a membership, ctrlthenarrative.com, and uh, I will see you in the Discord. All right, back to the show for good. I really started fucking with you a lot, obviously, besides like just the normal content you post. But when you talk about Melo, you don't only say he's an all-time great scorer. You say that Carmelo is an all-time great player. And I say this, I talk to people all the time where, you know, again, if, and we play this whole if game, but if the Pistons draft Melo second overall and he wins three championships in the first five years, what's that narrative coming out of Syracuse and everything that he did. But my question for you, bro, is why do you think Melo is not only a great time, all-time great scorer, but an all-time great player? Well, A, he's done the most important thing in the sport of basketball, which is scoring the ball, <laughs> just putting the ball in the basket. The game is about a bucket. What more do you want a man to do when, when a guy is able to give you 30 points with his eyes closed when a guy's able to give you 40 or 50 on any given night, eyes closed, <laughs> scoring's up here, bro. I don't care what anyone says. Historically speaking, from day one, scoring the basketball, and this is common sense stuff, is up here. Everything else comes after. So okay. if you do this right here better than everything else, 
what does that tell me? What more do I need from you? What more? How can I look at a guy as a coach or a teammate that goes out there and puts up 40 with his eyes closed? All the defensive attention is on him. All the you know eyes of the defense are on him. The road crowd is booing him. You have all these doubles, all these fucking defensive schemes designed to stop him. And here comes a guy on that insane pressure, is so advanced in his craft, so physically imposing, so skilled and so aggressive and such a dog that he's going to go put up 40 or 50 eyes closed. That, yo, like you can't act like scoring and then all these other things in basketball are equal because all those other things you do in basketball, whether it's passing the ball, and I'm not diminishing those things, they mean a lot. Passing the ball, rebounding, defending. The end game on all those goals is, hey, let's get the ball and score now. You know, that's the end game behind all those things you do behind a pass, behind an offensive or a defensive rebound, behind a, behind a defensive stop, behind every single thing you do on basketball, on the basketball court, the end game is to get a bucket. So that comes first, okay? Now, we already know Melo to me is the top five peer scorer ever. I got him there with uh, Kobe. I got him there with Michael, um, KD, uh, and he's, he's – uh, that's right there is number four. There's those are top four. Take whoever you want. Those are top four. Respect. Number five, I don't, I don't know. Number five, I could go in a different convo, but forget that. Top four peer score I've ever seen in my life. Now, you got that on the fact that he does that better than fucking <laughs> – if you really study the game, better than everyone that's played the game except for three guys. Okay, there's that. Um, no one's been a more complete score from three levels. No one's been a more complete score – from, you know, the ability to go in the mid-range, mid-post, post-up, um, you know, shoot the ball, shoot the ball in transition, off the dribble, shoot the three, all those things, right? The footwork, all that, the jabs, everything yep. you see. Okay, there, you're an A++ in the highest level in basketball. Now, the thing that they don't talk about, <laughs> Melo is a great passer. Melo was always a great passer. You know, Melo was always um, a willing defender when it came down to it and he was playing in meaningful games. He always got after it when it was time to go, and he was always guarding the other team's best player because that comes from being a competitor. People think, like, defense is some, you know, incredible skill that you develop in the summer. No, like, these guys are taught defense at a very young age. In college, by the time they know they're in college, they know their defensive principles, you know, as far as individual man-to-man goes. So from there on out, it's a competitive thing, and I think he's one of the great competitors of his time, too. If you really look at Melo, um, on a night-to-night basis, you know, in duels with a KD, in duels with a LeBron, in duels with a Kobe, or always showed you know, up. Always, always showed up on many nights. Took their lunch. Simple as I mean to say it like it is, right? So that footage is going to live forever. People could just turn that on anytime and go watch that. That's the ultimate truth, you know. If you want to know who Melo is as a player, but like to sit here, I hate the just a score narrative. I think is the most casual casual shit ever. A because what more do you need to be? Number two. <laughs> Number two, it's like you don't really study the guy's game enough or know or watch the guy's game enough to know that this guy has so many different elements to his game. You know, as a as a player, as a hooper, as a guy that's a competitor, his whole makeup and his whole DNA of a basketball from a basketball standpoint is complete. There's not a spot on the floor where he's uncomfortable. There's not a spot on the floor where he doesn't demand a double. There's not a spot on the floor to this day where, you know, he can't get his shot off. So to, you know, to sit here and act like he's just a score, come on, man, that's disrespectful. That's disrespectful because if you go ask the peers, and trust me, shit, it's all you could go look it up. I've asked many, many players, bro, to this day, and I'm not saying this because I'm on this show. I always tell my boys this. To this day, and I've talked to a lot of pros that have played the game. I've talked to a lot of guys that have defended Melo, that played with Melo, I always ask them, whether it be in a private convo, whether it be on a podcast, whether it be in an interview, who is the toughest guy to guard? The most people, the most name, the name that I've heard the most is Carmelo Anthony to this day, to this day. And I'm talking about it could be a role player that had to guard him. It could be a superstar that had to play against him. He was the toughest cover and he was the toughest matchup. So you could go ask those guys if he's just a scorer and see what they say to you. (laughs) Bro, uh. I love this right now because I don't have to say shit. You're literally speaking my <laughs> mind and like I'm just sitting back here and just like listening and smiling like this. But like it, it's just so funny how when you talk to people who know basketball, yeah, it's just like a just like a it's such a nice conversation. It's, best, bro. <laughs> it's just it's, it's such a nice convo. And like, yeah. you know, you talk about the passing and, and we talk about that all the time where the Lakers 
if they just want to drop it down to Mel in the post, he's a great playmaker throughout his entire career. He's always, like you said, a willing passer. One it might not show thing, up. Well, I, cut, I don't want to cut go you ahead. off. Go ahead. If you want to go see how complete of a player Carmelo is, go watch him in Team USA. No one adjusted easier to those situations. Yeah. No one was able to walk into FIBA basketball, a whole different game, you know, and play and impact and dominate and lead the way right away with LeBron on his team, with Kobe on his team, with Wade on his team, later on with KD on his team, with yep. all those guys. No one is able to walk in as effortlessly as him because he's a pure player and a complete player. He's an all-around player. He was able to go in an entire different setting in basketball and play his game and and be impactful. And that, if that's not an all-around player, then I don't know what it is. But go on, bro. Great point. And the reason they did that was, to your point, they respected the shit out of him. They yeah. knew how much of an overall great basketball player he was. Just because, you know, his career high in assists was like four yeah. doesn't mean he was a fucking ball hog. It means that it took two passes to get over to the corner instead of one. Thanks. And like, and like again, like you, you don't you don't know these things like looking at the box score and be like, oh. bro, bro Melo's his career high in assists was four. Oh, he's a fucking ball hog. It's like, did don't you know that when he's double, like he can't <laughs> skip it over and he, he needs to pass it to the guy up top yeah. who passes so it's just uh again casual shit that uh, casual shit, bro. Yeah. And and again, the whole point of like the point of basketball is to get the ball in the hoop. I, I don't know how else to say. Like if someone's an all time great defender, like it's amazing. Obviously, like you said, not diminishing those things, like they don't mean shit, but I've never heard it put like that that everything all the other things from a pest to a rebound to a defensive stop to a steal to everything, if it doesn't end up in a bucket, then like not that it was for nothing, but like that's yeah, yeah. the point. Right. That's the point. That's the point of game. This. I love that. <laughs> I love that. That's good shit. Um, all right. So, I mean, we could sit here and talk Denver, Mellow, and New York, Mellow, and how great he was all day long. Um, yeah, no. But what I want to know, know from you is how do you feel Mellow's been utilized over the past few years since he's left New York? So, even dating back to the OKC days when obviously that whole experiment didn't end up. Yeah, uh, as well as they wanted it to. We know what happened in Houston and even Portland, LA. Just what are your thoughts on how he's been utilized? And then also, I guess, to throw in there how he's been able to adjust. So, you know, I was one of the guys that was very vocal about it when Melo was basically driven out of the league because of one bad situation. Okay, see, um, you know, I was of the belief because of how complete and polished and skilled Melo was that he and how respected he was that. And I think this would have happened if the analytics boom didn't go down, but it probably would have happened for sure, actually, because you would have still had the inside game. But I was of the belief that Melo could have played the game like Dirk did. Now, Dirk till later years in Dallas. Now, I don't remember the exact age, but Dirk in 2011 was really supposed to be out of his prime or on the way out of his prime. But the franchise was running through him and building around him till the very end and committed to him till the very end. And Mark Cuban and coaching, the things that I said were lined up 1 to 15 year after year, whether they want or not. And he was able to crack through. And because of the great defensive pieces around him that were able to finally complement his game, was able to get that chip. I thought Melo had more than enough ability to keep going at that level from New York onwards. I thought, you know, Melo to this moment is capable of putting up 20, 25 a game if you run through him. Problem is, they're not going to do that because what happened is the perception changed and the perception changed in OKC, right? And in OKC, he went there. The New York situation ended bad because Phil Jackson, you know, he he fucked that up. He fucked that shit up. You know, then they had that new brass come in, that disrespect that they showed. Um, you know, it, it was, you know, straight up like it was like that shouldn't have happened. And the yeah. way they let him go, whatever. Goes to OKC, no training camp, goes there on media day. Uh, you know, and really he's just out there, you know, he's freestyling, bro. Playing with, again, a hyper-athletic point guard in Russ and a guy that plays the same position with him, Paul George. Now, he had to fit in on the fly. And for some reason, they attached this narrative to him of the bench role, of the role of, um, you know, oh, he's a vet, oh, he's older, oh, it's time to do this and that. Put him in a rocking chair by default. <laughs> you know, when he, I think he was just an all-star that season. Every year in New York, every year in New York, every year in New York. So 
you know, had a had a bad year in New York. Not a bad year, but they, he got hurt, right? Like he, he shut himself down for the season, right? 14-15. 14-15. And then you go into 16 uh, – sorry, 15-16, 16-17. At some point, Jeff Hornacek started to run the triangle offense with D. Rose and all those guys. Didn't work. Um, that team could have done some. So he goes into okay. New York with, like, this reputation. Next, next thing you know, OKC situation ain't good, you know. And from there – that's when the disrespect started. That's when he kind of got blackballed out of the league because you had this all-time great player and they were using him as a story, writing him off, you know, and, and yeah. it really fucked up how he's utilized because he goes from running the offense. He goes from being the main guy, the go-to guy, out of the post, in the mid-range, taking the last shot. His whole rhythm was disrupted. He was playing off the ball, standing in the corner waiting for three. You know, <laughs> he was playing the entire opposite of what he's done his whole life. Now, you tell me how many guys – can even pull that off just in the in the way he did. Not yep. many. And then you go on to talk about how many guys can pull that off, you know, get punished for it. You know, they said he didn't sacrifice. He sacrificed. Every year, bro. Every year, bro. Every they, year. He's at one point a fourth option in OKC. You know, what more do you want him to do? Then it's like they try to use the bad teammate angle. That didn't work. Players love playing with Melo. The league respects the shit out of this guy. So – from there, he had no choice, and it took him like a year or two to figure this out. It took him the year off. Yo, yeah. he's got to come back, reinvent it, and reapproach it in a different way because if not, he would have retired. And, you know, I think Portland did a good job of utilizing him the first year when he was starting. I think they did a good job the first year. And then in the second year, when you start bringing a guy like this off the bench, you're going to get inconsistency, bro, because you're using him in an inconsistent way. You know, Carmelo Anthony needs to be used a certain way. When you don't – and that's what I always say to these geeks on, on the analytics side. Like, they'll be looking at a percentage of, like, a, a Melo or, like, even even guys, like, that aren't on the Hall of Fame level, you know, uh, maybe even a IT or, like, a Deion Waiters type of guy. And it's like, yo, he's inconsistent. Well, one-night coach is bringing him in at the six-minute mark. One-night coach is bringing him in at the three-minute mark in the second quarter. One-night coach ain't playing him for the fucking second quarter. There's so much that goes into it that disrupts a player's rhythm, that disrupts a player's flow. Melo has been dealing with that from Portland onwards, right, from Houston onwards. So I don't look at Melo's numbers like that anymore. I look at Melo and see, is he going to get into Melo mode today, even if it's in a restricted yeah. fashion? And then from there, you take it from there, right? But you can't really tell a story with his numbers – I do think, you know, they've misutilized him. <sighs> Portland could have done a better job last year. I thought the game that Dame had 55, like, again, okay, you have Carmelo fucking Anthony on the floor. How about instead of Dame launching half-court threes with the defense draped all over him, yeah. and we put yeah. Denver a new look, and we put one of the best mid-post back-to-the-basket players ever <laughs> in the mid-post and just go to him just to switch it up. Yeah. That's a coaching thing. You know, Terry Stotts got away from that. He committed so far into just Dame and, and CJ iso ball, right? And I love those guys too, but like, yo, come on. You know, same thing every time down the floor. And then analytics have made Melo at this point a catch-and-shoot player, and it is what it is. He shoots the ball. He, if you tell Melo, yo, we just need you to shoot the three ball, he'll fucking do it, bro. He'll, that's easy for him. Yeah, so, and he is. And he is. And the Lakers, you know – it took him some years to figure that out. I'm glad he got to figure it out because they didn't even let the guy figure it out, and they wrote him off. Now he figured it out. He established himself, and now he has the ability to, I feel like, play two or three more years, and it's great for us as fans of him. But I still think to this day, you know, because of the analytics shifting it out to the point where he's just a catch-and-shoot three player, that's almost dumbing his game down. Um, and I think, you know, they could utilize him better to this moment. I thought he started off the year with the Lakers in a good groove. They were letting him, you know, take over in certain moments. They were letting him, you know, explore his game, play in spots that he's accustomed to. Um, you know, and you saw the production. It was immediate. So uh, the Lakers have a lot of shit to figure out right now. And, you know, I think Melo is just, you know, fitting in where he can. But I, I like what he's doing. But it's like, you know, at this point, I'm just happy to see the guy play every night. Nice. Yeah. yeah, man. Uh, well said. Uh, you know, we talk about all the time about how he's not a shooter, he's a scorer. Yeah. And a rhythm score at that where, you know, you mentioned guys like that coming off the bench. He doesn't know if, you know, it happened within the past week or two where Stanley Johnson picked up two quick fouls. So he got put into the game with nine minutes in the first. Most of the time he's in with five minutes in the first. Maybe, right. you know, he'll be put in with three minutes. And I think even more than that, it's what happens when he's in the game. Does he come in the game? And like, there's plenty of times this year where like we watch every game where he ends the first quarter without a field goal attempt. 
So you have this guy out there fucking running suicides yep. and s- sitting in the corner waiting for a shot. And then when you give it to him and he misses his first shot, then it's like, all right, shit, you know, he might not be on tonight. He misses a second shot. It's like, shit, he might not be on. Where it's like, yo, give him the ball on the block. Give him the ball to elbow and, like, let him develop some rhythm. Yep. And to, to all your points about analytics and the narrative around him, they don't allow him to do that because of that whole narrative. He's a bench player now. It's like... You know, he's going to pay the vet men, but, you know, we're paying THT 10 mil a year. So right. we, we got to make sure this guy eats before we make sure that Melo eats. Give him, we give him no room for error whatsoever. Ever, ever. And, right. it, it, you know, we talk about it where it's like, yo, they play. And, like, I'm talking specifically about the Lakers. But even I'm talking about it with the Blazers where, you know, Norman Powell last year when they gave up Gary Trent for him. And then Norman Powell is struggling. Like, no, we need to get this guy going. But when Melo starts two for two like all right you know thank you for contributing that so right. it's just that like mindset um financially and and just that whole narrative of all right this is who he is now yeah and that's it for sure bro it's frustrating to see man because he got put in that box oh yeah now guess what we could play a hall of famer fucking two mil five a vet minimum exactly. you know? and from there yeah. it changed everything you gave him this opportunity to just let him sit you know and not affect the franchise anyway but I feel like, yo, you're misusing the guy, but I think he could be a valuable, lethal weapon for your squad. So you're really missing out on that. I always laugh. I'm like, to this day, bro, to this day, <clears throat> you guys know this. How many times have you watched the Lakers game down the stretch, closing moments, and he doesn't touch the ball? But he's on the floor, but he doesn't touch the fucking ball. When hey, he's man. probably – he's their best shot creator. But, bro, they're paying Russ 40 mil. That's what I mean. <laughs> That's it, bro. Russ, think, Russ has been taking game-winning shots no. and missing them. I see Anthony Davis out on the wing for somehow, for some reason, on the wing, taking, <laughs> to, you know, dancing on a guy like he's KD, you know. And I get Anthony Davis can play out there, but, like, in a closing moment, do you know who you have on the floor with you? Which game was it? It was a game. It was the Kings games that kept going overtime. Melo was doing suicides in the overtimes. And then it was the games. Fuck, there was another game. I don't know if it was Charlotte. the same. Charlotte, Charlotte game. Maybe. Yeah, Charlotte game. There's been so many games this year. Yeah, I was going to say, yo, we're talking about like 20 I'm games right here, so I don't know which I'm one you're like, talking yo, about. I wish I could have Frank Vogel's job. This <laughs> I can call a timeout and say, yo, give Carmelo fucking Anthony the ball and clear out, okay? And take us home. Yeah. <laughs> and, bro, you know, it's funny. We were uh, reminiscing a little bit today about the whole bubble blazers, how fun that team was, yeah. and how many clutch shots Melo hit. Mm. And he was sitting in the corner. Yeah, and it's when you go, exact yeah, and then when you go to that first year, actually that was the first year, but earlier in that season, he hits game winning shot in Toronto where CJ yeah. Mello's guy helps, so he kicked it to Mello, Mello, quick little one dribble pull up, and like more often than and, and like we've seen, I, I could fucking put a compilation of Mello game winners dating back to Denver, but then you know people are like, oh yeah, but that was fifteen years ago. It's like he's been doing this shit two years ago. Is that yeah. like recent enough for you to be like, all right, shit, maybe we should get the ball in his hand. But no, because Russ is getting paid 44 mil. Right. He needs that last shot because AD is like the guy he's going to get, get that shot when LeBron's out. So it's like, yeah. it's just frustrating. It sucks. But man, it, I mean, you know, I feel like with this Laker season, bro, like if they go and they turn this around and there's a lot of shit they got to figure out come playoff time. I feel like the legend of Melo can grow because I think this yeah. Lakers team, I think this Lakers team does have potential to – like, I don't know who's going to want to see this firepower in a seven-game series. Of course. People are talking shit right now, but, like, when games slow down, you got LeBron, you got AD, it gets scary. Yeah. They win at home. They win, at the, they win two on the road. And going back home, that's when Melo's going to come out in those quarters and, like, single-handedly win you a game, win you a quarter. And, um, you know – really just affect the game in a crucial moment. And I think, you know, he's tailor-made to do that. I think there's a chance he could do that this year. Yeah. Great point, bro. Um, all right, yo, before we get to the last question where it's control A narrative, um, I just have some quick little fun hitting questions for you. Hit me. One favorite basketball sneaker ever. <clears throat> you could take this as to play in or just looks-wise. Whatever it's you want. It's funny that you got me on the show. And, again, I swear to God I ain't saying this because I'm on the show. You know, my very first, not my very first, but my very favorite, one of my first basketball sneakers was a Mellow 1.5. Classic. The baby blue and white. And our brand colors, Ball Don't Stop colors, have been inspired by that for since day one. Wow. Colors. 
those are my favorite colors. Um, Fire. that 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 you that um sky blue with the white man is just I feel like it was just such a, a beautiful sh- sneaker, man. And playing wise, it was just great too, man. Um, that that's up there for me. That's the that's that. my favorite sneaker of all time. It had a huge impact wow. on my life, man. I wish I wish I had that shit on me. I had that. That was like my first pair of Jordans, and like obviously man. I was a huge Mellow fan growing up. So like. Damn, I, I'll probably I'll message you on Instagram a picture of it. Yo, the bottom of those things when I was wearing those every fucking day in fifth, sixth grade, yo, I could go like ice skating on that shit. That's how like clear the fucking bottom is and worn bro, out. So I destroyed the shit out of them, bro. I, <laughs> iconic, bro. I still I kept my shit because I'm like, yo, this is some shit. I kept it, but I destroyed it, bro. The bottom is. I love that. I lo- <laughs> yo, you you might be able to find one or two pairs on eBay, FYI. You got it. I got it. Um, favorite mellow moment. <clears throat> Shh. there's been so many off, bro. off the dome off the dome like what what pops in your head that you're like yeah this one you know why you know what you, you already mentioned it you know that portland game winner toronto yeah the reason that portland game winner is such a favorite moment of mine it's 19 years a long time man it's like you, you killing me bro one moment but like that portland game winner it was a gigantic fuck you <laughs> yeah, to the world to the world yeah, it was and and there was moments where in a January, in a November of 20, what year was he out? 19? Uh, 18 to 19. 18, 18, 19, where I would go on my podcast and 50,000 people would watch it and there would be 300 comments saying, no, you are wrong. He cannot do that. And I would be saying, you bring this guy in right now and he will hit game winners for you. He will close games for you and he will put on a show and send the road crowd into silence for you. <laughs> Respect. And when that happened in Toronto, I'm from Canada. When that happened in Toronto, man, I was jumping up and down because I'm like, holy fuck, bro. Like, I've never called something word for word. But to see him do it, I saw the passion. I know how much that meant to him because it was like, I'm here, I'm back, and I ain't leaving again. That was huge. Respect. All that other shit, he's been celebrated for. We know what that was. But it was that moment right there where he got out of the trenches with that shot, I feel like. And that moment, I'll never forget that moment. Um, but I got to sneak one more in though, bro. I got to yeah. sneak one more in. He had, um, in the, in the 07 season or it was the 08 season, he had a 49 point game. It was on the wizards. Wizards. They double teamed them at the end. Is that what they double teamed them at the end, but it's one of the nastiest performances I've seen. I just remember just watching it on TV and saying they cannot, they could do nothing with him though. Yeah. He was just punking dudes. He could have had 70 then the head he got. Had he, had he got going the right way, man? Yeah. What's your favorite What's your favorite mellow moment? Man, I'm from New York, so it's got to be, like, the first game here. Just the, like, energy and just the hope, bro. Like, the hope where it's like, yo, we have Amari. Yeah. But mellow coming here, like, yo, me- like, Amari, obviously, he was playing at MVP level, but adding mellow to that. But yeah. also, I think another one to me, I don't know if it's necessary. I'm going to throw one in, too. I hope you don't mind. Uh, I, I don't know if it's necessarily a favor, but it's more of like a symbolic one. So I don't know if you remember this game. It was his last year with the Knicks. It was a few weeks before the trade deadline. And they were playing in Atlanta. And they went into, I think it was quadruple overtime. And I think Melo put up like 44 points and he hit okay. game winning yeah, 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 game yeah. winning shot, game tying yeah, shot yeah. at then the fourth quarter, at the end of the first overtime, at then the second time. And then he fouled out on a bullshit ass call. And he oh, was yeah. getting fucking hacked. And yeah. just like that. And to me, bro, like that game to me just symbolized his entire Who he career is. in New York where yeah, it was like, yeah, yeah. yo, he did every, he laid it out all on the fucking court. Right. He was getting his headband knocked off and like no right. fouls called and shit like that. So for me, that was just like, I knew shit was over where I was like, they, they can't yeah. come back from that. I knew there were some rumors about trading Rose for Rubio and all this shit. Right, and I was right, like, right. Fuck, the Knicks are going to rebuild. So yeah, 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 yeah. Another iconic one. No um, all right. This is kind of two similar questions, but I'm gonna ask the first one first. Most underrated player in the league. In the in the league right now? Then Will Barton. All right. I think he does a great I think he's it's not talked about enough, bro. I watch the Nuggets a lot. It goes back to my mellow days too, but like, you know, he does it on both ends. He uh he defends at a high level and then he can score the ball at a high level. Like I see him go just say, me and Jokic are going to play the one, the two-man game. I might put up 25 tonight. I'm going to go defend the other team's best player. I'm going to go get this chase down block. Like I'm going to go create this shot and make this play, man. Will Barton, people got to watch out for Will Barton more. Um, he's there. But who, who you got? What you, who you thinking? 
Underrated player. I feel like you'll like this one. What, this is, again, we talk about the eye test and shit like that. I think D'Angelo Russell. Yeah. He's when I, when he you became just watched, underrated. He became underrated. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Yeah. And like, yeah, he was an all-star that one year in, in Brooklyn. So, like, fair enough. But, like, yeah. just when you watch him play, he looks like a star player. Yeah, and the sure. way, like, the littlest things. I remember back in the day, I went to Hofstra basketball camp. And the way they taught you, I, I live out on Long Island. So, I went to Hofstra camp every summer. And the way they taught you to, like, go around the screen where it's, like, wherever your defender is, just go the opposite. So, if he's going under, obviously, yeah. go over if, if he's yeah, yeah, following yeah. behind you. So, little shit like that. So, I feel like the way uh, so D'Angelo hard. Russell's – D'Angelo Russell utilizes screens as like yeah. he's like a wizard. Yeah. And I used to say this shit about Jeff Teague, bro. Yeah, Jeff like Teague, Jeff yeah. Teague is like that too. But I yeah. feel like D'Lo is exactly like that. D'Lo so. is D'Lo, man. That's a good. Shit, I hate that he became underrated, bro. Yeah, yeah. I don't even count him as underrated. But yeah, you're probably right, man. Like all star. They're going to a black hole in Minnesota, bro. Right. Like <laughs> black hole. Unless your name is Cat, then. That trade, okay. that trade though, that kind of killed his momentum. But like he's yeah. gonna pick it back up. I feel like. I hope so, man. I like him a lot. Yeah. Uh, mo- all right, last little quick hitter. Most underutilized player in the league. Mm. A guy that you think should be should have a bigger role. Should have a bigger role. Straight up. And again, it's kind of similar, but a little bit. <clears throat> she asked. She had to say mellow with the theme of the show, bro. Yeah. Respect. There's a few guys that I feel like should be playing more. I think Trey Burke. I said this the other day on the Mavericks. Remember Trey Burke for you guys is Knicks. Yeah. Now you tell me what you think of Trey Burke because when you saw Trey Burke, and you I know where you're going with this. I know where you're going with this. Forty-four, you know, forty-one points in 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 Charlotte. You know, the game winner in Boston. He looked like a star, and I'm like, yo, this guy's at least a six man. He can at least play the Lou Will role for them. So I see Dallas, their offense sometimes halts, and I'm like, yo, there's like 15 points sitting there, but hey, shit, if you don't want to use it, you don't got to use it, man. Yeah. I feel like he's underutilized. Who do you think? You know, I thought about this a little bit, yeah. and this doesn't – I don't know if this counts, but I'm going to go with this one anyway because fuck it. Mm-hmm. I thought Gary Trent, when he was in Portland and I was yeah, watching him every was. single game, and he now was. you look at what he's doing in Toronto, I'm like, yo, this yeah. guy is legit. He could shoot guy, the ball. He, 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 he got out of it though. He and he did. And now look what the fuck he's doing in Toronto, putting up 30 points a game, hitting situations, like situations, bro. It, that's the theme of the show. Situations right there. That's it. Um, Ekum, I appreciate you coming on. Uh before we let all of our guests go, though, we give them the floor to control a narrative. It doesn't have to be basketball related, it doesn't have to be sports related. Um, doesn't have to be doesn't have to be mellow related, obviously. But if you have one, I'm gonna give you the floor to control a narrative. <clears throat> A narrative like that's out there yeah literally from like yo fuck uh wooden desks to like um read more literally whatever the fuck you want i just saw you know shit what, man, I, think the, I think the world is too divided right now as a whole i think the world is too divided i think we're all like you know people are either this or that they're either this color or that color they're either unbaxed or vaxxed and it's like there's so much going on man it's like i think the world needs to come together more and unite because I think, you know, that division is being taken advantage of by a lot of people. Um, You know, and I just feel like we need to come together as a whole, as a human race, you know, as God's children and really, you know, stand up for what we believe in and, 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 you know, live with love, you know, and, um, you know, stop putting people into these boxes, you know, stop falling so easily for certain propagandas and, you know, you know, labeling per people and outlawing people and just, you know, like we just got to go back to, you know, pre-social media days, man, where life was just simple. You know, you did your thing, you went home, you were able to have a regular conversation with someone, <laughs> you know, without judging them, without labeling them and just, you know, just get back to that, man. I miss those days of life, man. I love that. Staying outside till the fucking sun went down, playing that basketball, wiffle cool. ball, all that shit. Yeah, man, that was the best. Respect, man. Yo, for real, yeah. Ekum. I appreciate you so much for taking fucking 51 minutes, let alone fucking 20, whatever I said. I was like, yo, sometimes it goes 20 to 45. I was like, we'll see how the convo goes. I kind of figured it was going to be a little at the higher end. But for real, This man, what happens when you get people that speak basketball and actually know basketball. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to post Facts, this too, bro. You got you to gotta tell me um, where this is available. Absolutely. I'm, I'm going to hit you up, and then I'm going to ta- make a little mini episode out of it too, bro. Me and Absolutely. You. Absolutely, bro. Appreciate everything you're doing with – you know, fuck the whole mellow thing, but just the whole basketball culture because there's a lot of people out there who 
you know, again, we could talk about it all day, but the geeks, as you call them, I love that word, the geeks. Um, and, uh, you know, you have a lot of people on your, you're impacting a lot of people and actually making people watch basketball. Yeah. Um, and I think it's dope. So keep it on. Appreciate you guys, man. Keep doing it. Keep going. Keep doing what you're doing. And it's going to keep growing, man. The wheel really fuck with that. I appreciate you, bro. Thank you, fam.